Hi, my name is Julia Ekstrom, and I'm an environmental social scientist at the California Department of Water Resources. In this presentation today, I'm going to talk about drinking water and some of the science that is being developed and used in California to reduce the risks of water shortage. So first, we're going to start off with an image. Looking at this image, I want you to think about what it means to you. Up until a few weeks ago, it may have triggered thoughts of thirst or a cup of water to drink. Now, given the global public health crisis, this faucet may now trigger thoughts of washing your hands, something that is being talked about a lot right now by public health officials across the world. And I assume for most of you watching, and I hope I'm correct when I say this, that most of you take for granted that you can turn off and on your faucet and when you turn it on, water comes out every single time. Whether it is for drinking, cleaning, or other necessities, there is nothing more critical to life than fresh water. But this remains a growing challenge around the world with population growth, increasing pressures of development, and climate change. And the United States, even California, is not immune to these challenges. California is located along the eastern edge of the Pacific Ocean, along the west coast of the United States. Our climate is considered Mediterranean, meaning we have warm, dry summers and cool, wet winters. Because of our location, moisture in the atmosphere comes across the Pacific Ocean, and in the winter, it runs into our mountain, large mountain range. And it often falls as rain and snow, mostly across Northern California. We get most of our precipitation for water supply through just a few large storms. So when we don't get those, it can present a challenge, especially if it happens two or three years in a row. What rain and snow we do get falls mostly in the north along the, and on the Sierra Nevada mountain range here. We rely on this snow to slowly melt and deliver water through connected rivers, reservoirs, lakes, and into underground aquifers. Now the majority of the population is located in the south. Red here is urban areas shown on the right hand map. So we've built a system of aqueducts that move the water to where people need it. An aqueduct shown here supplements urban areas and some farms. And for scale, this aqueduct in some places is as wide as a four lane highway. Now, there are also a lot of homes and businesses that have wells that pull water up from underground. This groundwater is also filled up by rain and snow melt, but over longer periods of time. As climate changes, and we've already observed its changes, temperatures are rising and will continue to increase globally and in California. Scientists have developed models to project what, what changes to expect and how that will affect our water supplies. So one example of a of climate model and how it's going to affect demand is the number of extreme heat days. These are projected to increase. In the past, in Sacramento, where I am now, we've had an average of four days per year over 104 degrees. Yeah, that's pretty hot. According to some of the models, entire summers by the end of the century could be over 104 degrees. So I'm going to repeat that. It means entire summers by the end of the century could be over 104 degrees. And it's a similar trend statewide. And this could have impacts on our demand, meaning how much water we want to use. How about snowpack? The snow in the Sierra Nevada mountain range is our primary storage for water in California. So the changes projected and already happening are a major focus for water resource managers. Climate science projections are quite clear around snowpack. It's about the timing of the snow melt, which is getting earlier in the spring, and whether precipitation can fall as snow because temperature changes. All the models are projecting substantially less snow by the end of the century. Here, as of this is, these maps are as of April 1st in each time period. So the 1950s, we have mid-century, and then we have the end of this century. And this model, which is a particularly dry one, but it shows 
where there is very little snow stored in the mountains by the end of the century, and even much less in 30 years from now. And so all that I wanted to give you as context for drought in California, that we are unique, but as historically we've had droughts, and that's not new given our climate. But with more people needing water and with hotter temperatures in the summer and less snow in the mountains, this creates a challenge for people and ecosystems that use, expect, and otherwise need water. The drought starting in 2012 was severe in terms of how little rain and snow we got, and also in terms of how hot it was. It was dominant here in everyone's mind. Even this message, like the serious drought, help us save water, was posted along major highways throughout the state. Over 2,500 households on their own wells went dry. And this is the on, only those who reported to the state government. There could have been a lot more. Many drinking water suppliers even requested state assistance. Now, California has historically experienced dry periods, like I said, meaning we've had lower amounts of rain and snowfall varies from year to year. This chart shows us how dry or how wet it was compared to past years. Each year is represented by a bar. The red bars are those that were drier than average, and the blue bars were those that were wetter than average. And the bigger the bar, the more extreme the condition. The 1976-77 drought was a short but severe drought, and it led to the state passing a law that requires large urban water suppliers to have a long-term plan to ensure water reliability. Now each drought that we've had has taught us lessons and led to adjustments in this law and how urban drinking water is managed. So this includes more rigorous planning for dry years, near term and long term, using water more efficiently inside and outside of homes, and the improvements continue including those passed in 2018 after a, our last major drought of 2012 to roughly 2016. So that's what's circled here. This law from 2018 was unique in that it called out the need to help small water agencies and households on their own wells. And the law pointed to Department of Water Resources, where I'm working, to work with experts, stakeholders, and other agencies on how to reduce water shortage and drought risks for small water suppliers and rural communities. The bigger purpose of the law is to help reduce future risk of water shortage and droughts for these groups in particular. So we had two goals due this year in 2020. First, identify who is at risk and vulnerable to water shortage and drought. And then second, rec develop recommendations to reduce risks through local planning steps. So to meet these goals, we worked closely with experts and other stakeholders for a year, and we developed a scoring for risk. So we did this for over 4,000 small water agencies and all the 5,000 communities where there are homes who have their own wells. And so how do we estimate risk? Well, we use more than 30 data sets to calculate water shortage risk. And these data sets represent a range of issues that stakeholders, some of them shown here, told us were important to include. And the notes that I have in this slide are an example of some of what were taken from these meetings. So we worked closer, very closely with these stakeholders over a year. Uh, so these issues covered where suppliers and households were exposed to hazardous condi conditions and events, and this is related to shortage, including wildfire risk, geology that affects reliability of well water, and also what areas have surrounding agriculture, areas where groundwater is already showing to be depleted, areas known to have water quality issues, including the presence of salts in the groundwater, and several others. We also include climate change projections in terms of wildfire risk, increasing temperatures, and seawater coming into a water source. 
We also included data on things that make a supplier or a household vulnerable to shortage events and drought conditions. Does a water supplier have a drought plan in place already? Do they rely on one source of water or multiple? These are some of the data sets we use to help point to vulnerabilities. Compiling all this information and sharing it is one way the state can help empower small water suppliers and rural communities. This is not about the number of the risk score, but about helping to inform what is driving risk in their area and to their resources. So we built a tool to help them explore their risks. This is designed to help inform the suppliers and other water resource managers what is driving risk of water shortage and drought. And I wanna show you a bit about this. It lays out some of, somewhat of a scoreboard. Water suppliers are listed. For today, we're gonna to use letters. And each of them has an estimated risk score. This changes annually depending on the year's precipitation conditions and if the supplier has updated its infrastructure or changed things organizationally. And along the top, we have risk factors. These are climate change risk factors right here listed, fire, heat, sea level rise. Then we have more risk factors, exposure to current conditions and events. Then we get into the infrastructure vulnerabilities and then into the organizational types of vulnerabilities. Then lastly, if they've had a history of impacts during the last drought. So we pull all these, all this information goes into a risk score about data we have on each of these factors gets presented here. So we put little dots for ones that we have data on and color them to represent how much they contribute to risk. Dark red represents high risk issues and yellow is low risk. So we have this for each supplier. And so now what? You can hover to get different information about each dot for any supplier. But the real value comes when a supplier or a community or regional water agency develops its own drought risk assessment. A supplier highlighted here can create a narrative about its drought risk. We've built in maps too, but this here really lays out what is contributing to their estimated drought and water shortage risk. Knowledge and access to information is empowerment, and that is what we are trying to support. So this offers a head start for small suppliers and rural communities to do a drought risk assessment, something that cities have been doing for years. And given California's unique climate, this is an important part of building resilience. So next time you turn on your faucet, I want you to remember that scientists managers, engineers, and so many others are working hard to ensure safe, reliable drinking water for you and everyone in California. Thank you and stay safe.